Um, if you've not been in one of my classes before, or any of my online classes, I'm not a standard sort of teacher which drones on and then asks you to ask, uh, to ask questions when I say so. You can ask questions at any time you want to. I keep an eye on the chat box down here. So if you see me looking down to my right down there, you know I'm looking at the chat box to see if there's anything that I need to answer. If I do miss a question, and I haven't answered it, then uh, just please do ask it again. So we're going to do some work today I'm going to be talking about um, a lot of stuff to do with uh, grief and bereavement and so on. I'm not going to uh, cover absolutely everything in absolute detail. The notes do. The reason I'm not is because some of it is quite emotive. And I'm work we're starting with working with um, children and grief because that's a very specialist area to work with. And as I've said at the top here, it's possible that a child psychologist might be better to deal with child grief, but the guidelines that are here will allow you to work effectively. I'm working from the notes, but I won't be covering all the notes. So do when you when you get the notes, do make sure that you read them. They'll come out uh, when I send the video out after the seminar. I'll be including a link that you can download the, the full notes. And there's 20 pages of it, 18 pages. So I won't be covering absolutely everything. And as I say, some of it's quite emotive, and I don't want to have everybody grizzling and crying and not able to see through their tears what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to tell you how we do things. Now with children. One of the biggest problems with um, children grief is the magical thought processes that exist in a child's mind until they fully understand two particular concepts. One of which is the world doesn't revolve around them and they're not special. Some people argue that all children are special, but most of you will know exactly what I mean. That what they think, wish or want has no bearing on what actually happens unless they act on those thoughts, wishes and wants. And children at a very young age don't really realize this. So if a loved one dies, it's entirely possible that the child would truly believe that it was in some way their fault. And as, I've, as you can see in this uh, section in the italics here, a bit Freudian, and then I've had more than one case where a, a loved one has died shortly after the child had discovered masturbation and believed that the death was a punishment for them or something to do with their, their masturbation anyway, especially if they already felt guilty. Much more likely in Catholic families um, and to an extent, Jewish families. Jewish guilt, Catholic guilt, it's not a criticism, it's just difficult to work through. So if you're Catholic or Jewish, you probably already know about that anyway. The power of magical thought is often misunderstood. Uh, and so I like to quote something, one of my own magical thought memories from when I was very young, because it illustrates the sheer idiocy of it, but to the child it's not idiotic. I was four, um, thereabouts, when the war was coming to an end, and my mother received a telegram which was to say that my father had died or was missing in action. Uh, and I wasn't old enough to know exactly what the telegram was about. But later, mother told, uh, I think it was her mother, uh, and they both looked at me, and my grandmother says something that I don't remember now, but it, was, it felt like reproachment. And you know, until I was about nine or 10 years old, I actually believed I had started World War II. As daft as it sounds, I really believe I started, because it was, said my father had died in the war and it was said as if somehow or another this was my fault and because a child assumes that everything extreme or everything that is noticeable happens because of them to them or for them uh, it was very easy for me to take on board that i believed that i started world war ii and that lasted in my brain in mind until i was about 10 or 11. by the time i was eight or nine i realized i hadn't but there's still that sort of little sneaky thought that somehow i'd magic the whole thing into being um, can you just type me an OK few of you if you understand the importance of that? Because this is exactly how, oh good, you all grasped it straight away, excellent. And this is the problem with, with magical thought. A child will believe anything around them is to do with them, uh, whether it's good or whether it's bad. And that is just how magical thought works. And a lot of people forget that. So if an odd one dies, it's entirely possible that the child will believe that it's in some way their fault. And it's especially true where there's guilt, as I've just been talking about, whether it's warranted or unwarranted. Uh, and they can feel that the child was a punishment for them. Sensitively aware children, not unusually believe, anything around them is, is connected to them, as I've said just now. And, and it's not even unknown for a child in a fit of petulance, so we're being restricted in some way, to wish somebody dead. And if that individual should die, while the child can still remember wishing it, you can see where that can lead. And I actually had a client who had wished his father dead. Um, he wasn't English. Uh, his mother had said to him he couldn't bring his, home, his school friend home to play um, because daddy was ill. And he said, I wish daddy was dead. And his father died that night. 
Um, and when the client came to me, that particular memory surfaced during analysis, and that was the source of most of his property. He was suffering from depression. As a matter of interest, his father was 40 when he died, and the child was the his child when he came to me was 39. So you can see where the depression was coming from. So almost any neurotic response can result from a child's grief response, anger, withdrawal, truancy, eating problems, IBS, apparent Tourette syndrome. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Precocity, stealing, bedwitting, bedwitting uh, or soiling, running away, disruptive behavior, just about any somatic illness. When I say apparent Tourette syndrome, it looks like Tourette's and it would probably be diagnosed as Tourette's, but it may not be because it will give way to grief work. I've encountered that a few times. I'm hesitant to say I don't work with children, but I've been teaching for many, many years, and I've taught a lot of people who do work with children, and that's where this knowledge comes from. And also, before I teach anything at all, even on a free webinar like this one, I make sure that what I'm talking about is right. Uh, so they're all expressions of grief, and the important thing about it is you're working with a child who's experiencing any neurotic symptom after a loss, you should not attempt to suppress it or control it by a hypnotic suggestion. So Attempts to suppress the grief or to suppress the tears could lead, would increase stress because it was no longer being expressed. And in fact, if the, unless the death was more than a year previously, you won't be seeking to effect any relief anyway. Uh, you can help the child be more accepting of the loss and help them to release any guilt that's become associated with it. And so in the context of this document, the best way to work is conversationally. Ask the child questions about the disease, what they love most, what they didn't like, stories about times they spent with them, um, if the disease had looked after them sometimes, what mum and dad have said, how they found out, that's very important, how they found out about the death, and if they knew exactly what that meant at the beginning. Be interested. Let the child feel they're telling you just how wonderful, or indeed awful, the disease was. Be sure that you don't show a reaction if they say that the, the something was awful or horrible about the person. Never show a reaction, um, because the child will misread it. And the, the person coming to you is talking about their experiences as a child when they lost somebody. Again, don't show a reaction. Work factually. Um, I've never, I'm one doesn't show reactions in therapy, positive or negative. I'm a facilitator, and I don't need to share my clients' grief, emotions of any sort. Never have done. And in case you're wondering, at one point I was seeing 40 clients a week with a 40 client waiting list, all by referrals, purely simply because I didn't get involved with my clients. I worked. Um, dissociated from them. So I didn't get carried along with their emotions and therefore I wasn't reacting to it. Uh, you're right, Diane, that's exactly how I've taught it would work. But a lot of people here today, of course, have not had lessons from me, so they don't know. Uh, actually, yes, Sandra, you're absolutely right. They can make a child believe it's therefore another reason why we work this way. Absolutely. Dissociated is important. So when you're working with a child and you work that way, there will be tears which you should allow to fall. But encourage talking through the tears because the presence of emotion is likely to bring forward something of importance. And that's as far as I'm going in particular on child work. So are you all okay with what I've covered there? It's only very skimpy, but it gives you a little idea of exactly how you would work with a child. In fact, one or two people have worked with that. I did this seminar once before, I think it was in 2014, and a lot of people have worked with it um, with that. That's all there is on child work. Um, and so we're going to move on a bit now. So the grief buster. This whole webinar came about as a result of the Grief Buster. And it's a very flippant title for a very serious subject and the release of unresolved grief. And it's worthy of the title Grief Buster um, because that's exactly what it does. It's a powerful routine for releasing trapped anguish, shame, guilt, other negative feelings. Uh, and as I've said here, it's an area which every therapist will have to work at some point in their career. And we owe it to our clients to know precisely how to work, how to help them. Now, in yellow here, the important update, because this is an update since I last taught this particular seminar. Um, the neuroscience-based BWRT, some of you know about it and some of you may not, has a version of the Grief Buster that successfully bypasses the need for extended grieving. It can only be utilized by BWRT practitioners, and I'm not covering it in this webinar. So I should be talking about the standard approach to grief um, that you need, it, that we're talking about atypical grief, really, not, not recent bereavement. I will be talking about recent bereavement and telling you something about it. But the whole the grief buster is about atypical grief. If you have BWRT, even only at level one, you can use the BWRT grief buster maybe only two or three days after the bereavement if the person wants to change. 
If they don't want to change, then you can't. It's as simple as that. But if they want to let go of the pain and instead still feel the love, which some do, then you can do that. Um, in the early days of BWRT, before the grief bus even existed, uh, one of our practitioners worked with a lady who had found her seven months old son dead in his cot. He worked with her only a week later and managed to set her free. And if you've worked with people suffering uh, where they've lost a child like that, you know that is remarkable, it's astounding in fact. I, I've worked with stuff like that two or three times, but using the older methods and it was tough. But BWRT resolved it very, very quickly. Oh, okay, Genevieve. Uh, and Shelley, thank you for that comment. If any of you don't know about BWLT, there isn't time to discuss it on this seminar. Um, but if you want to know more about it, email me afterwards. Um, oh, perfect. Thank you, Elisa. That's very valuable to me to know. That's the, that's the fastest, the day after. Brilliant. Um, uh, so what I'm talking about here uh, will be, for those of you that have done BWLT, very old fashioned. But there is an advantage in the old version of the Beef Buster which I'll be talking about in a minute. There isn't a, a distinct advantage. Uh, oh, Sarah, you've experienced it as well. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. The Grief Buster is amazing. Um, the, the BWRT version. If you've not done BWRT um, and you don't know what we're talking about here, if you've not done BWRT, you can find out more about it by going to bwrt.org or you can email me directly, um, twatternutsbox.com or on the Facebook group, whatever. And I'm also doing, um, in a couple of weeks' time, on a Wednesday evening, I'm doing an introduction to BWRT, so that those of you who don't know what it is about can find out and discover what it's like to train online. And if you've not done it before, this is what it's like to train online. And this new platform allows me to have a much bigger picture of me, good thing or bad thing, I'm not quite sure, but allows a, a bigger video where I'm just chatting and not referring to any notes on the screen. Uh, there's some more notes on the screen later. Now, with the grief buster that I'm talking about today, we're not talking about what you might call normal grief, but what is referred to usually as one of the forms of atypical grief. It, in other words, it's gone on for longer than would be considered usual. The grieving person is stuck and can't move on. And sometimes it's quite mild, a feeling that they haven't really got over it properly. There's some depression or whatever. They're able to function on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's here that the grief buster really does come into its own. Other times, there's a readiness to tears and sobbing at the merest mention of the deceased individual's name, and a higher intensity of pain than you would normally expect after maybe a couple of years or something. Uh, and so this routine may not be suitable in that particular case if there is an excessive amount of emotion, and you might need a, an analytical approach, or possibly a more traditional approach to grief uh, release, which I'm going to talk about later on. Sometimes there'll be unresolved issues from way before the disease died, um, which cannot now be properly addressed, and we have to discover those. As I've said, I'm working directly from the notes, so when you look at the notes, you'll see bits of it. Oh, he said that, he read that aloud. And indeed, I'm reading from the notes because I know that this is everything that I want to say, but there's little fill-ins that aren't in the notes. So it's wise to carry out a bit of conscious exploratory work beforehand uh, to establish what it is that the client's actually hanging on to and to resolve it as far as possible. Uh, more often than not, it's guilt in one of its many forms. Sometimes it's anger, where the, cl the client had had an issue with, frequently with a parent and had intended that one of these days I'm going to tell them just what they did to me. One of these days I'm going to let them see how they behaved and what it did. One of these days, one of these days, but they never did. Then the client, their parent dies and they can't discharge the anger. It can be a bit darker. It can be against, it might be a parent, but it can be against uh, an uncle or another relative, usually male, where there's been sexual interference or outright sexual abuse. And they've been determined that one, day, one of these days when they can work up enough courage, they're going to tell everybody what they did. They never did work enough courage, and now the person's died. And they feel that you can't talk ill of the dead, and I'll cover that particular thing later on as well. So it can be guilt, it can just as easily be anger. The client can be angry at the deceased for dying, angry, angry at God. They can even deny that God exists since they wouldn't let this person die when they did, uh, or some other deity or person for taking him or her, or themselves for some reason. And whatever, unless the situation is addressed, you're unlikely to be very successful. And there are three important points to bear in mind. If the bereavement has happened recently, you shouldn't use the grief buster routine. Normal grieving takes between 18 months and two years to complete. 
And the work on this paper is specifically designed for use when the completion of the process doesn't occur. And I'm going to go through the process in a minute. Recent bereavement requires a totally different approach. Read this part of the paper first, if you're reading the paper. Uh, take ma making sure to study and understand the four stages of grief and how to manifest and the traditional approach shown later. And then later on, you'll see further hints and advice for what to do with recent loss. And we take personality into account as well later on. Always bear in mind that many individuals will experience as much grief, maybe even more for a loss of a loved pet as for a human family member or friend. It's very important. No matter how this seems to you, it's your client's grief that you're working with. Whatever they feel is what they feel, not what they've chosen to feel. Their feelings are everybody's valid as those of the individual who's grieving for a lost parent or child. I have dealt with people uh, in the past who've been made really ill by losing a dog um, or a cat. One guy, you may struggle to believe this, but it's the absolute truth, he came to me suffering grief because his Siamese fighting fish had died. Uh, and it wasn't straightforward, he hadn't died dead, it had suffered, if you know anything about tropical fish, it had suffered fin rot which is a disease which particularly affects tropical, um, the Siamese fighting fish. I used to breed them at one time. Uh, and it, the, it's the males that had these long flying fins and they're iridescent blue and red and low and they're, they're fabulous looking fish. Anyway, they get fin rot and they don't only really die from it, but they do lose their fins. So they have to be isolated. And he got this fish in an isolated tank and uh, he said, I felt that he knew me, I felt that he recognised me. And he looked over this poor fish that lost most of its fins and the fish was apparently looking out at him in its isolation tank. But when he went over to it, the fish had died. And it affected him severely. Now, the important thing is, of course, that some people say, what, over a fish? Even if you even think that, you mustn't show it. I've had people suffering grief from loss of a hamster, a gerbil, a guinea pig, dogs, very common cats, and suffering grief every bit as much. But the important thing to recognize, grief is grief, and it's what the client that's feeling that you're working with. <laughs> Are we on okay so far? All, all agree, in agreement. Please, uh, if you're not, if there's anything you want to challenge or ask me about, please do that right now. <laughs> okay, all good. You're all on it. It's good. The difficult thing is animal grief. If you're not an animal person, I, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, Michelle, you know, I, I understand that completely. And if you're not an animal lover, you can't possibly begin to grasp the pain that can come as a result of losing a, losing a beloved pet. Um, but the client will, and that's what you work with. Um, right, let's uh, come back onto my next screen here. So, working with grief and bereavement, the grief pattern um, is not to be confused with the task the psyche has to undertake to, um, to get through the grief. That's the four tasks, which we'll talk about in a minute. The pattern or template which most individuals display, denial, almost everybody does a denial when, when they first hear of the death, even if it's no. That is denial. Whether you think it is or not, it's, it's denial. Uh, if, if it catches you more by surprise, and it is a form of denial. It's a human response. Sometimes that lasts two or three seconds, uh, but other times that might last several weeks. I, I had a student many years ago who still had his daughter's mobile phone number in his phone, even though he knew logically that she had died, but he had a feeling that she was still alive. I did the grief buster with him. There were copious tears. I don't think anybody here today was on that class. It was a few years ago now. I did the grief buster with him. There were lots of tears. This was a, a, a training class for hypnotherapy. And several, there were three people in the room, and they looked at me as if I was the cruelest person on the face of the earth. And I got told off by them. I said, what on earth do you think you were doing? And they named him. You've upset him terribly. You should have more respect. I'm amazed at you. All those things that you expect. And because they were new students. But the next day they came in and they were very sympathetic towards him. He said, bugger off, I'm fine. And he said, Terence, I've taken my daughter's telephone number out of my phone. This is five years down the line. I've taken my daughter's telephone number out of my mobile and I feel a lot better. So you can see what the grief buster does. It wasn't the BWRT buster. It was the standard one that I'm going to be talking about in a minute. Um, Jane, oh, yeah, exactly. And I've dealt with people that are still in denial. They might have come out of denial. Uh, but they never got to the fourth stage. They don't get to this stage necessarily, the acceptance. They do denial, then anger at the hospital for not treating, or the person for dying, or the doctor for not recognizing, or any of themselves are not recognizing, they do anger. Then they get depression. 
then you might go back into denial. Actually, I don't think this person died. I think it's I think it's a con. I think I've been conned. I don't think I died at all. Then they go into anger again. How dare they con me? It's a conspiracy theory. Huh? Then they get depressed. Then they go back into anger. Then they go back into denial. It's getting to this acceptance stage that is the purpose that we have to do. These aren't linear, as I've said. They don't occur in order and then expire. They're inclined to oscillate backwards and forwards. Um, denial is universal. Anger can be directed at itself, as I've said before. Depression is inevitable. It might be brief last, or last for up to two or three years or so. The depression can last a very short time, a week, a few days, uh, and then the person gets over it. Depends on personality type, which I'll talk more about in a minute. I'm looking at the clock. I've got a huge amount to get through, and I must get on to the personality bit. If I don't manage to cover everything, do read the notes. Uh, acceptance is the final stage wherein the bereaved individual begins to function relatively normally and move on through life. It doesn't work sequentially, as I've said, and occasionally there's a fifth element, which is bargaining. This is usually between anger and depression. It's more common among critical illness, where the grief is the impending loss of one's own life. When they suddenly start doing, um, and it's very common with cancer sufferers that have been told they're terminal, they suddenly start doing bike rides for charity or as many marathons as they can do in order to get uh, to, to curry favour with, with the with the Almighty. As you know, if I, if I do these good things, perhaps I won't die. It's bargaining. I may not even recognise us what it is, but um, bargaining is um, a, a very common thing with uh, with with grief. Linda, other people feel good. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. This is why, if you've not heard my grief buster before, this will please you greatly, Linda. That's how to do it. Linda, you've got BWRT as well, so you could use either the BWRT version or the version that is uh, that I'm going to be showing you here. I have to be honest, I slightly prefer my own version. There's a very powerful reason for it, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, but you can't use it um, early. BWRT you can use very, very early. Um, my version is old. It's, it's, I mean, the BWRT version is based on the same thing. So the four tasks of mourning, these are the four tasks that the psyche has to complete in order to be able to move forward and begin to live life normally once more. And they are to accept the reality of the loss, to work through the pain, to adjust to a life without the deceased, and to emotionally re relocate the deceased. Now, as I've said, if you do the BWRT grief buster, it seems to short circuit that and bypass even the need. There's been a lot of it done now, and there's no kickbacks, there's no price to pay, there's no sudden collapse, there's no uh, sudden somatic symptoms, there's no sudden illness, there's no reason at all, and it's being used the first time it was used was some four years ago, and all it's done is set people free. So some people get stuck uh, on one, at the accepting the reality of the loss. Some people get stuck there um, by a defense mechanism, which will either deny that death has taken place or disavow the importance of it. There's considerable emotional and physical pain associated with grief, and this must be worked through it too. Now, the old way of doing it is, of course, just to talk about it and get people almost really desensitizing themselves about it as they talk about it and keep on and on about it, as indeed they should. A period of adjustment um, to a life without the disease, which may include learning new skills, either social or practical. Many people have difficulty at stage four. Um, where they are emotionally relocating the, the deceased. Um, they need to be able to let go of the emotional ties, and that's the most difficult thing for some people, so they can comfortably build new relationships. Many people don't, of course. Um, and this is where our therapeutic skills can be truly put to the test, as we help the client to recognize the truth that it's perfectly acceptable and moral to move on, to form new relationships, and to find peace and happiness. And the grief buster that I'm going to be talking about today does an awful lot of that. Um, there's a good response to the notion that the most fitting tribute to the deceased is to be able to think of them with warmth and a good feeling. So most people accomplish these four tasks given time and understanding, but some may get stuck at any stage. The individual who gets stuck at stage one, not really suitable for this therapy. They need careful and prolonged attention, as uh, you'll see later on. The grief buster can help with stage two if it's become prolonged, but only if the bereaved individual truly wants to move on. This is the important thing. If the individual doesn't really want to move on, this is the working through the pain. If they don't want to move on, then there's not a lot that you can do. When your client can talk easily about the disease without any excessive sad emotion, and when there's some warmth, even humor present during the conversation, then you know you're getting somewhere. 
Stages three and four are often seamlessly linked together. They respond best to what is shown here, often producing startling, even dramatic changes in the demeanor and well-being of the bereaved. Now, this is one of the most important things that I'm going to say in this seminar. If you have trouble in observing true anguish, don't even attempt grief buster, because you are going to look at agony. There's no doubt about it. This is why if you can work in dissociated mode, as I was always done, and as I teach people to do, if you're able to do that, there won't be a problem. If you are not able to work in dissociated mode, it usually means you've not had any analytical therapy of your own or extended therapy of your own, and you're identifying with a client. And when you feel a client's emotions, you're not really a caring, loving person. What you're doing is identifying a part of your own psyche which is still hurting. That's really what empathy is. It's not not what people often think it is, it's just purely and simply that the client's misery triggers some of your own misery. I went through extended hypnoanalysis at the beginning of my career. I managed to dispense with almost all of the shitty stuff that was around me as I was growing up and as a young adult. So if you have difficulty in observing true anguish, don't even attempt the grief buster. Most of the time it goes smooth and easy, but it can get tough. It's useful in three circumstances. <clears throat> Your client is presented with symptoms of depression, apathy or stress, and a feeling they've not been able to get over a bereavement that happened 18 months or more ago. A shorter period than this still needs more time. Don't forget, that's in the old rules, if you like. Having said that, I did use the standard grief buster, this one with somebody after a year, and that was effective. And I used a much modified version of it with somebody only five days after her son had committed suicide. That's a whole different story. I'm not teaching that one today. But that was a modified version of Grief Buster, and she was ready to let go of it, and she did. Um, they are probably still stuck somewhere around stage three or four, and may well report that they either didn't choose or were not able to release or demonstrate much emotion at the time of the death. Um, fourth point, uh, sorry, second point, your client's presented for a direct suggestion for smoking or weight control, and in conversation, you discover there's been a bereavement that still hurts. It might be from many years ago, but it still hurts. And sometimes during hypnoanalysis, but only when you're convinced that the event is stopping the analysis from proceeding properly. If it's not stopping the analysis from proceeding, continue with the analysis, get, out, get that out of the way, uh, and then do the grief bit afterwards. It's especially the case where the loss has occurred during the formative years, from birth up to sort of 15, 16 or so, uh, because it can obviously create a high degree of resistance, the idea of going back. And you shouldn't use it as a matter of course, because it's, it's possible that a repression may be linked to it in some way, and you shouldn't really interfere with what the psyche, the client's psyche, wants to do. So the process. And as I've said in the notes here, this is a serious situation, and some preparation is essential if you're to guarantee that what you're doing will be beneficial to your client. Without that preparation, there's a risk that you'll actually make your client feel worse, though it's most unlikely to cause any lasting harm. So this is how I actually work. To begin, I explained to the client, I believe that between us, we can get him or her to feel more comfortable, to come to terms with the loss, but they can't do it without stuck emotion being released. So we're being very fair to the client. We tell them they're going to, they're going to feel emotion. I tell them this might make them feel wretched for a short time during the session, but soon after that, they'll start to feel a whole lot more comfortable within themselves. They are occasionally doubtful whether they can face it, and we shouldn't attempt to persuade them beyond assuring them that we won't do anything that will harm them. Most decide they'd like to continue, and I've worked, I, I can't tell you how many times I've used this, over and over. So the first thing you do is to establish the circumstances of the death as far as able, without creating great distress. So you need tact and a gentle approach. Uh, and I need to know, you need to know whether your client was present at the moment of death, and if not, uh, this is written as if I'm doing it now. I wrote this in 1997 originally, The Grief Buster. I need to know whether my client was present at the moment of death, and if not, where he or she was when they first knew about it. It helps if I can establish that the death was sudden or prolonged, expected or shot. I no longer see clients, as most of you know. So when I wrote this, in fact, I was still seeing clients. 90, might be been earlier in 97. So now I'm going to skip forward a bit to the most important part. Now, there's work here that you'll read. It's highly emotional. Uh, it's emotionally charged. I'm not going to read it out because I don't want to send any of you off. And there's always a possibility. Yeah, okay, Akili, yeah, you can do WSM work, um, definitely. So, when you've worked through the first part of the process and tells you exactly how to do it, you will need a fairly good state of, of hypnosis. 
Um, now, this is the important thing. This is not something yellow on mine, but it's not on yours. Immediately, the emotion starts to subside, or after a few minutes in any case, I say, and this is the, what you'll say to your client. Now, I want you to remember one time when you were really having a lovely time with the person's name, we'll say it's somebody called Pete. A lovely time with Pete, one really special time with Pete. Can you remember it? As soon as they say they can, um, I can see a memory in their mind. I'll say, tell me about that. Tell me about how it was so clearly that I can see it if it was really there. When they've told me, I'll say, I bet that must have been a whole lot of those lovely times with him or her. Can you remember another time? Nearly always respond with another recall almost instantly. And this is when I implant a suggestion because their emotions have been all over the place by now and they'll accept it very readily into the subconscious. The suggestion is, you know, I'm really pleased you told me about those wonderful times because I know that now, whenever you think of Pete, you're going to find them, those sad memories just at the last, just those last little while, last such a short time. They're going to be replaced by all the hundreds of happy and wonderful times you shared over so many years together. So many more happy times with Pete than sad times. So many more times to fill your mind with warmth and happiness and love and even laughter because you know that Pete would really like that. And Pete would really like to see that you are happy whenever you thought of him. You can have more of the same, of course. Now, can you see why that is so powerful? This is what separates this old BWRT grief, old uh, grief buster from the new one. The new one doesn't have the replacement. This has a replacement to fill the vacuum. And that's why I like it. And uh, But it's really most suitable for work um, after when it's, when it's atypical grief. Uh, am I still online? Nobody's actually saying anything. Can you, are you all still there? I ask myself. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Sarah, did that, can you see why that would be helpful to you, your client? Uh, and yeah, you see, there is, there is a vacuum. Um, there's, there's a distinct vacuum. And using something like that completely, they can think of the person they've lost, and instead of the misery, they can feel, I mean, with an abortion, it's slightly different, Sarah, so you will need to adapt it slightly, but you can still see exactly how you could use it. Um, some imaginative work and so on. Yeah, a more traditional approach. Yes, um, Michael, in, exactly. Uh, Genevieve, don't worry, because the recording has everything, so if, if your recording is stuttering a bit. Um, Michelle, you couldn't do BWRT at the same time because this is a hypnosis, so you can't do BWRT. You have to do one or the other. Uh, okay, Sarah, good, you can see how to do that. So, Michelle, you couldn't do BWRT with this one. You have to do one or the other. They're, they're totally different. Um, Sarah, I haven't done any work with that, uh, with this. Um, I haven't actually worked much with that. I have worked with it, but nothing that I would actually teach because I haven't done enough of it. So I can't really comment on working with miscarriages. Um, that, that's a bit specialist. Um, <laughs> Nikki, I'll come to that one in a minute. What if it was something I didn't like much, but fears that they should be upset? <laughs> I'd be working and saying, why do you think you should be upset? If you didn't like me, you should be pleased. I'd be, be provocative. I do like provocative therapy on occasions. And, and then if they said that's disgusting, I'd say, well, it's disgusting you didn't like them. If you didn't like them and they moved away and you're never going to see them again and they, you knew they moved away, you'd be pleased. So why not be pleased? <laughs> it's, it is provocative, um, but I, I don't have a problem with that. So... I'm going to skim through this because otherwise I won't get to the bit about personalities that I want to work with. So when you get the notes, you'll see under a traditional approach to grief release, there's a whole lot of stuff there. Um, and in fact, I've outlined it on the screen, I think. Um, a spiritual method, a scientific method. This is for people who are logically orientated with no spirituality about them at all. After accident, after suicide, after accident or suicide for the logically or the scientific mind. So when you look through these notes, there's, it's fully laid out and it will tell you exactly how to work. Um, some people feel a sense of us even more. Uh, I've never known that, Linda. Um, I, I, it, it's possible, but I've never known it. And I've used the Grief Buster God knows how many times. And all they've done, all that's ever happened, is that people say, oh, it feels wonderful. They just love it. And they smile. And I get, I mean, obviously we test it when the client's still there. And all I've ever happened is somebody smiling, not even with tears, smiling and saying, God, I've forgotten those times. Um, so I, I don't, in my experience, it's not the case. Um, and I, I, I think that you're looking at them still feeling miserable while they look back. Whereas if you imagine that they're actually feeling pleased because they've just put those positive memories into their subconscious, you might see how that works. 
Uh, and if anybody else on here has ever done the grief buster, they'll know that's exactly what happens. The client is mightily relieved afterwards. So I've never known that particular circumstance. But I mean, and if it did happen, then you just go through it again. And the, the fact, the inescapable fact, of course, is that somebody has died and they cannot come back. So if all you did was to get them to totally accept this fact, then you're going to make an improvement. Uh, yes, Tony, thank you. Um, as you've noticed, there weren't any comparisons to any sense of emptiness. They were to be happy. The client is in a highly charged emotional state because of the work we've done before. That's deliberate. So when they're in that highly charged emotional state, we give them basically a suggestion that they put those methods, those thoughts and feelings into their subconscious. So whenever they think of the person, that's what they'll think of. So I think it's extraordinarily unlikely that they'll feel the sense of loss anymore. I mean, I've been using this since 1997, and I've never experienced that, Linda, I have to say. Um, I, I wouldn't, actually, Michael, because that, that, would, that would encourage still an attachment, and it would tend to encourage a denial. I mean, try it. I've never done that um, uh, myself. Uh, I actually personally wouldn't be happy with it. But nonetheless, if you want to try it, try it. You won't do any harm uh, at all, but I'm not convinced that it'd be good. Um, Sandra, yes, that, 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 that the only time you get unstuck is when they can't remember any, any happy memories, and then you have to work slightly differently. But that's, even that's not difficult, because if they say, I can't remember any happy memories, you can say, my goodness, so and so, whoever it was, they'll be pleased you can't remember any of the good times you have with them. And if they say, I really can't remember any good times, you say, then tell me exactly what it is that's upsetting you. In other words, never, ever, ever be phased. Whatever the client tells you, you work with, you just feed it back. If, if it isn't sort of working to the plan, as it were, just feed it straight back and say, well, okay, if you can't remember happy memories, exactly why are you, what are you grieving for? Tell me what is what it is, and I'll help you to feel better. Um, is that making sense to everybody, by the way? Just give me an OK if, that, if you've seen the point of that. Good. OK, you've all got it. Excellent. OK, it's been good. Just like to make sure that everybody's with it all. <laughs> so, I mean, as I say, I've never had that particular. I have had a situation where somebody said they, they couldn't find any good memories. And I said, not even one. I'm remembering the client very clearly, actually. Not even one. And she said, not even one. I said, how many bad memories? She said, oh. Don't get me started on that. I said, then why are you grieving? Which is a bit like I was saying in answer to Nikki just now. <laughs> you, know, you should be happy. And she had to think about it. And she said, I think I suppose, I think I feel as if I ought to. And that really is one of the things that often get people get stuck into. Now, personality and grief. Um, and this is very important because somebody's personality affects the way that they grieve. So the notes for this section take simple bullet points because it's an overview of how each type reacts and responds to the bereavement and grief process. Uh, so you've already got the text that will give you a good working methodology. You can, if you want to, do a, a, grief, pers a grief personality test, but you don't necessarily have to. Um, it might not be accurate because they might well be feeling vulnerable and working in a different mode from the usual self as a result. So we're working with the WSN process. If you haven't done the WSN process, don't worry about it. Just I think there's something in the notes about it somewhere. Um, for uh, warrior, just assume control orientated. For settler, you assume um, the, the sort of uh, appeasing person, the adaptable person who likes everybody. And in nomad, the slightly outrageous, fun-loving sort of person. So in warrior mode, there'll be um, the client will tell you what mode they're operating in when you talk to them. In warrior mode, they'll be factual and give you details about the death. In settler mode, they'll be emotional and tell you how it was a huge loss. In nomad mode, they'll be graphic and tell you about the funeral. So there are going to be many occasions when you can't be sure. And when you say to them, uh, where do you live in your body? That will provide an answer. Um, and if they say they live in their head, they're warrior. If they live in their torso or their heart, they're settler. If they don't know what you mean on somewhere else, they're nomads. Um, so something like this works well. When I'm working with grief or loss, I always like to get an idea of how my client works in that respect. This is what you say to the client. And I don't want to unwittingly cause offence. Some people believe there's nothing after death, while others think there must be more than we know. So what sort of thoughts do you have about that? Do you get a there's nothing response? You have got a warrior in front of you, and you need to ask. You don't need to ask the rest of the question. Um, you can just respond with, "Okay, that's fine. I'm beginning to understand how I can help you." 
if you get the, I think there's something else, they're either set or a nomad, and you need more definition. So you can say, where does that bit of you that I, you call I or me actually live in your body? The settler is going to say heart or body and know that those are immediate. The nomad either won't understand the question or give you a rather detached answer. And I say, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. There's a fear of death script at the end of the notes, and it contains ideas you can use when necessary in hypnosis, uh, because sometimes people's fear of death is really ramped up by uh, bereavement or grief. No suggestion you should use it with client, there are times when it can be helpful. So the responses of each type. So death on the warrior. Bereavement heightens fears or awareness of their own mortality. And they've often had a real shake. They've often thought they were immortal until then, especially if they're fairly young. It creates anger, which is usually constrained, often isn't sure. They'll often feel more emotion than they show. This is all in your notes. Uh, if there's, or, or be able to show, if there's guilt, the anger can be exacerbated and sometimes directed outwards to anybody present. Um, and in fact, not necessarily anybody that knew the person that's died, just anybody else there. If the loss is close, grief can get stuck at stage three, and that's usually in the depression stage. And, or I said that depression, which can take turn to the deeper form, despair. Despair is the deeper form of depression. Despair. You can think of it, I like the old-fashioned word, melancholy. Uh, it's a nice word for a horrible situation, but despair turns into melancholy. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, Tony. Um, if the loss is closed, grief can get stuck at stage three. There's an unwillingness with the warrior, unwillingness to move on to the acceptance stage, since this means they're not getting their own way. That's the warrior. Um, millions grieve when Princess Dinah died without having met her. Um, that's a kind of... Um, hysterical thing, a group hysteria, Tony, and a lot of people believe that they should be grieving, so they did. Um, they didn't know her, <laughs> but you know, and in fact, there were a, a, some bishop, I can't remember who it was, one bishop said, what on earth is this collective public grieving? It's nonsensical. You can only grieve for somebody that you know and somebody who lost. Diana didn't belong to anybody, the, the, the public. Diana was just a public figure. But it was the same when Rudolf Valentino died, in the 30s, and people threw themselves off bridges and committed suicide, women usually, because Valentino, Rudolf Valentino had died. I'm not old enough to remember that, I hasten to add. <laughs> yes, they very did. You're right, Sarah. People did do well. Uh, yeah, okay, Michael. You see, it's interesting, isn't it? It's, it's not real grief. It's the association of an idea and a feeling that you're in somehow connected with a person. But I'm hoping you can all see that that's the remnants of magical thought. Believing, is that making sense to everybody? When you grieve for somebody you've never met because of their music hit a chord with you or something about Diana's um, way of being hit a chord with you, it's, it's, it's your own emotional state and you feel a bit of that has gone. So it's a kind of, exactly, it's the same thing, yeah. Absolutely right. And it is a kind of magical thought because a part of you is associated with that. But it's not grief for the person, it's, 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 it feels like it, but it's actually a, a link to magical thought. Oh, it's, yeah, empathy, Tony, in its rawest form, that is, it's triggering your own miseries. <laughs> Michael, absolutely. Uh, so, death and the settler. They'll often seek compensation. She had a good life, or free from pain now, I think she'd had enough. This is the settler's way of, of dealing with it. The comments may reflect their own feelings of inadequacy or guilt about the loss. Uh, and the power suggestion. Yeah, absolutely right, Tony. You're, you're, you're spot on. And the loss, seeing them go and hearing about them. Yeah, Genevieve, you, you're, you're all on, the, on target here. Uh, the comments may reflect their own feelings of inadequacy or guilt about the loss. They'll be supportive of others, but also need the support of others, maybe seeking reassurance that the deceased has gone to a better place. They need you to be assured that this is the case. You can choose to do so or just question them about it. If the loss is close, they may profess an urge to join the de deceased. They can easily get stuck or partly stuck at stage one. Denial. I keep thinking her walk through the door at any moment. You know, we talked about this earlier, that my client, my student rather, this had his daughter's um, telephone number in his, on his mobile. There's an unwillingness to move on to acceptance because this feels disloyal. The purpose of this section of this seminar is to give you information about what you're going to work with and need to work with through the grief processes. So with uh, the settler, you're going to need to work on that 
it feels disloyal to move on with the warrior uh, and unwillingness to move to the acceptance because it means they're not getting their own way so you're going to help them to understand that they're not going to get their own way the person's gone and died and that's the end of it uh, and now finally the nomad the nomad is a very very intricate and complex character and they are very very difficult to read the nomad may show more apparent grief than they actually feel they may have a selfish approach to the loss fretting about how it's messed up their plans sometimes they'll stress that to you and sometimes they won't uh, if the loss is close they'll demand more attention than either of the other two groups they might become irritated by what they believe to be the overreactions of others that won't necessarily show this in spite of the sometimes apparently totally self-centered reactions they are still suffering they don't usually get stuck at any stage you can move through the process faster than most where they don't uh, let go there's usually unadmitted negativity towards the deceased so if they don't let go of the grief there's usually a very strong negative feeling uh, directed towards the the person that's lost um, another thing the nomads do and they will sometimes tell you is they have to act as if they're grief stricken because they believe that that's required of them so the nomad um, at funerals will turn on a good set of tears when they're not actually feeling anything at all but they feel that they ought to uh, and, they're the, and they're consummate actors the nomad uh, and so the nomad is a very difficult person to deal with because you don't you can't be certain whether they're stuck in grief or not they may well be and you can only accept that they are but listen to the language patterns if they show irritation because it's got in their way and it's affected their life then you know that really they're not suffering as much grief as they are appearing to show uh, now that's all my notes that I want to go through we've got five minutes left six or five and a half minutes um, there's more in the notes so when you get them do read through them because there's a lot about the more traditional style of working so we've got time for some questions